It makes me feel immensely proud of our collective national effort in pulling together behind those on the front line to combat this unprecedented challenge. All of this is a truly national endeavour. We've even mobilised 99-year-old veterans. And I think everyone would agree that Captain Tom Moore embodies the sense of service and duty ingrained in our armed forces. Our role has been entirely in support of the heroic healthcare workers on the front line. Well, as we've just seen, it's been an extraordinary year for our Armed Forces and Armed Forces Day was set to be an extraordinary occasion here in Scarborough. This part of the world is really proud of its military ties. It was from here that the British monitored the German fleet during the Great War and just a little way inland is RAF Filingdales, the huge pyramid radar on the North York Moors that acts as the UK's ballistic missile early warning system. As host to this year's national event, there would have been air displays, beach landings and parades along the seafront down here in South Bay. Instead, this seaside town, like everywhere else across the UK, is recovering from the ravages of lockdown, as life was quite literally put on hold. But at the heart of the fight against COVID-19, there's been an incredible relationship between the military, the NHS and communities up and down the country. And that is something worth celebrating. I was given special access to reservist unit 4th Battalion, the Yorkshire Regiment, as they were deployed on the front line in this global pandemic. On April the 1st, 2020, the UK government called upon 3,000 reservists across the UK to mobilise in response to COVID-19. It was to be the largest call to arms the modern army reserve has ever seen. A test of their capabilities, a chance to prove the value of the nation's reserve force. It was a mission they had not trained for and an enemy no one could see. A virus that threatened the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of people that transformed everyday life for each and every citizen across the country. Over 100 members of 4th Battalion, the Yorkshire Regiment, found themselves on the front line. Fuzzy, we've got the um, toss up. Wednesday evening and the email arrives from the local authorities. Every few days, their requests for pop-up mobile testing units come in, dependent on hotspots of COVID-19. And did you say you'd heard from... Captain Andy Fenton is the 4 York's operations officer. We get um, tw about 24 hours notice, we'll take those orders, we'll turn them into military speak and we'll send those orders down to the soldiers who are located across the region and they get up the next morning and off they go and spend the whole day testing. OK, 65 for North Allerton. Providing capacity uh, okay, to so test thousands of civilians a day across eight counties is a huge operation for the reservists. And in order to reduce risk to their families, for the first time ever, they've moved into their local army reserve centres, known as the ARCs. Tucked away down a back street in Huddersfield town centre is the grand old Duke of Wellington's regiment barracks. Inside, the walls are lined with those who've fallen in the two great wars. For the past two months, this has been home to the soldiers of 2020, helping in the fight against COVID-19. So this is where I've been sleeping for the last six weeks. Obviously, we're all spaced out on these camp cots. It's interesting settings, sleeping in the hall here, but everyone's been sort of coming together as a big family, I think, as we've been spending a lot of time together. I've brought my dumbbells in so we can work out on an evening. It's not too bad. We're all used to it now. Yeah, plugs help. Nobody expected this kind of deployment to come up. Obviously, it came out of the blue for everyone. But I think a lot of the guys jumped at the opportunity to sort of help out in the community. And in a lot of ways, it exemplifies why people join the Army Reserve, if you know what I mean. 
First stop in the morning is the main regional testing hub, where the PPE and test kits are stored, the lead site making use of the now redundant park and ride. With the kit collected, it's then on to the testing site. Today, mobile testing unit Team 11 are in a car park in a small town south of Leeds. With little advance warning, they must be able to pop up these facilities anywhere required. Trunks. Yeah, they're good to go. The way that the MTUs run, it's a bit like a McDonald's drive through What I have here is the entry station. It's a bit like where you order your food from. So what we do is we check your QR code and your booking against some photo ID to make sure you're who you say you are, and we'll also issue them the test. What will happen then is they'll get passed over to one of my supervisors who's behind me, parked up, and they'll be able to perform the test uh, under their own steam. There's some instructions in there that guides them through. Hi there, sir. Once they've completed the test, they'll pop their hazard lights on, and one of my supervisors will check uh, that they've done the test correctly and it's packed, and then we'll move them on to the exit. Can I see your QR code, please, sir? At the exit, what we do is we take barcodes and we link them to yeah, their booking systems well, to ensure sir. that they get the results correctly, uh, and then we'll take the tests off them and uh, let them go on their way. OK, it's all done, sir. Thank you. Have a good day now. You're going to put your head back, mouth open as wide as you can, say ah, until you can see your tonsils. When you can see your tonsils, you're then going to take the swab, rub it against one tonsil for five seconds, take it out. A lot of the sites that we get assigned to uh, are based off heat mapping, so we're not sure where we're going to until the night before when an algorithm runs through and tells us where the hot spots are. So we have to be pretty fluid and adaptable. Despite having little time to plan, sites like these can be set up in under 10 minutes. In order to keep the soldiers safe, people arriving must keep their windows up at all times, except when receiving or returning the test. Rather than shouting through the windows, burner phones are used where signal allows, enabling them to speak more calmly to the often nervous civilians. All right, lovely. Have you guys got any uh, hand sanitizer? It's great. It's an enormous sense of well-being. So proud that I can actually do it in my own country. Obviously, I've, I've served in Iraq and Afghanistan as a, res a reservist mobiliser regular. So obviously, this is a lot different to that, but... but... Pleased to have played a part in it. Yeah, massively. We couldn't ask for any better, really. I mean, I'm with my own county and I'm helping my, my people, my county, so very happy. It's like a privilege and an honour. Uh, by the way, my dad's pretty proud of this as well because he's an ex-serviceman himself, so he's, um, you know, he's, uh, he's very proud of what I'm doing. Each 12-man team has become its own household bubble, so if someone were to become infected, it wouldn't bring the whole force down. Empty barracks stand waiting for teams to isolate should anyone show symptoms. To date, no soldiers have become infected. So this is the test kit. Inside here, we have everything um, the customer needs to do the test, all right? That includes step-by-step -step instructions, a swab, a vial to put the swab in once they've done it, Freeze a bag with moisture absorbing pad in there and then that'll get double bagged into this biohazard bag which is loaded with their barcode there which we can scan when they leave. The reservists have spent years preparing for conflict, practicing section attacks on vast training areas in Denmark and Lithuania. But many of the procedures they've learnt are surprisingly transferable. On this site we've got three different areas. You can consider them the three sections of a platoon. Report lines. Uh, they're key areas of the battle where we may need to report information back and we can code word them. But those report lines can conversely be, be used to change the states on my site. For example, being able to have a report line for when the queue is at a certain length in order to increase my manning and process that queue quicker. Uh, we also have uh, left of arc and right of arc. They're often described as uh, no-fire lines, so lines that we cannot fire across. And again, we're using them on the site. So in order to keep civilians safe, we'll always keep them on the outside of the left of arc and the right of arc of the site. So you're very much using battle terminology here at this COVID testing site? Yes, in a way it makes us feel more comfortable uh, and helps us uh, utilise the training that we've been given to best effect. That's you done, sir. Take care. The community haven't you been too. shy about showing their gratitude, often appearing with trays of scones and bagels, which are always well received. 20 miles away in Rotherham, Team 66 have set up shop in the shadow of the New York Stadium. Inside, the pitch lies silent the grass pristine and untouched. But outside in the car park, there's a constant flow of visitors. When the call went out, it went to the entire regiment, which includes the band. Band Sergeant Major W02 Alex Brannan was one of the first to volunteer. 
I definitely think it is a perfect deployment because you can draw on everything you've learned from the military and use your civilian skills at the same time. People are turning up here very anxious, very worried, and it's just trying to put them at ease, sometimes making them laugh if you can, and just uh, help them get through the, uh, the situation. From my day job is something that you know does cross over quite a lot, you know, speaking to the public, explaining the process, putting them at ease, you know, through you know, what sometimes is quite a, an anxious or um, stressful situation. I think this is probably what the reserves are meant for. Like if they didn't mobilise the reserves for this, like what's the point in having us? Everything's sort of getting lifted now, I think it's going to become probably more important. Um, but without people getting tested, there'll be people that won't be able to see family members, won't be able to go to work or get paid. So it's, it's extremely important for a lot of people coming through here. Yeah. After a long, hot day, everything must be sprayed down and the tests are placed in special cool boxes ready to be delivered back to the hub. These soldiers are very much at the coalface in the fight against COVID-19, but are quick to point out they are a small cog in a huge effort which has brought all the authorities together. John runs the Leeds testing site and says he's never worked with the military before. They've been absolutely outstanding. I think it's a credit to them that the, they are standing up and helping the fight against the coronavirus. We've had all sorts of things happen. We've had guys being promoted here. So we had a, the little parade in, uh, in our welfare area up there one afternoon, which were uh, an experience which they invited me along to. Um, we've been presented with some bar, uh, badges and invited to Catrick when it gets back to normal to the family day. So all great, great relationship we've had. every night we do yeah this is um every evening end of every day and uh, straight back into it again tomorrow getting pretty slick at it now as well as the vehicles back at the ark personnel must also be washed no one is allowed into the living space until they've passed through a decontamination zone they deek it here head outside to the showers and then in through another door to enter the clean area this is our time to, to prove our capability and uh, within the last 12 months we've been building up our skill set and being ready for something um, but not being on readiness and what this has given us is given us an opportunity to prove our worth. When we got asked to be mobilised there was, there was a moment there where we just, we just hoped that our soldiers would answer the call. What we've got to remember is that these people have got civilian lives and civilian jobs. They've also got families and commitments. So when we ask them to do something, there's an awful lot of considerations that, that they need to take into account. It's not an order. They're not being told to mobilise. They're being asked, can you mobilise? Can you step up and do something for your country? And can you do something for the civilian authorities um, and assist the general public? It's been difficult from times. I've got a young family at home. I've got a little girl who's seven months old, so I've never had to leave her. I'm sure in the future I'll be able to explain that this is what you know, Daddy did during the, the coronavirus outbreak. Initially, Four Yorks ran the mobile testing sites entirely themselves. Now, with a unit of regular soldiers from Two Yorks supporting them, they're able to take some leave. What are you going to do with your leave? So, when I go back home, I'll obviously have to go shopping and get some cat food and stuff like that, because my housemates have been looking after my cat. I'll probably have, some, have a barbecue with my housemates or something, which will be good. They only have 24 hours of downtime and they're still at two hours' notice to move. Nevertheless, the leave is invaluable. How do you think you will look back on this time of your life? Probably something that I'll be proud of. Yeah, because I think it's... Um, it's going to be a footnote in history as well. It's the first time in 100 years that something like this has happened in, in the UK, especially. Um, and yeah, you can sort of look back and be like, I was part of that. You know, I helped out with the, uh, with the testing and fighting the coronavirus in the UK.
The incredible efforts to support and assist the NHS has been a real tri-service operation, from the mobile test units we've just seen to the airlifting of patients from remote regions and the delivery of essential personal protective equipment, all to save lives and stop the spread of COVID-19. Simon Newton looks back. In March, the MOD created a COVID support force and Operation Rescript was born. 20,000 personnel were put on standby and in April, 3,000 reservists also joined the force. Within days, the military sprung into action, delivering tanks of oxygen and personal protective equipment to hospitals. In Scotland, soldiers with chemical warfare expertise worked with nursing staff at Glasgow Royal Infirmary, making sure their PPE fitted properly. As the crisis deepened, the military were also drafted in to help build NHS Nightingale hospitals up and down the country. The biggest inside the XL Centre in East London opened in March with capacity for 4,000 beds. In Harrogate, the Royal Artillery stepped in to help convert the town's convention centre into a hospital, while troops built this 124-bed Nightingale inside the NEC in Birmingham in just a fortnight. The difference between driving a military vehicle and driving this is that you go in to have patients in the back. In Wales, up to 20% of paramedics were absent either because they had symptoms of COVID-19 or were self-isolating. To make sure they could run a full emergency service, 70 soldiers were trained to drive civilian ambulances, ready to be called upon if needed. Around the country, 200 personnel have been involved in supporting ambulance trusts. And then let your barcode there, sir, please. That's perfect, thank you so much. One of the most visible contributions the military's made, though, has been on testing. Up and down the country, troops set up 92 of these mobile testing sites in just a week. We have 6,000 people preparing in all kinds of ways to support the government's response to COVID-19. The Royal Navy also did its bit, with Royal Marines running testing centres at two sites in Cornwall, while at Devonport in Plymouth, naval reservists use their 3D printers to produce headbands for NHS face shields. The Royal Navy also contributed to the Aviation Task Force, a tri-service fleet of helicopters which were put at the NHS's disposal 24 hours a day to help move its staff around the country and airlift patients. In April, a Puma from RAF Benson was involved in one of the force's first Covid missions transporting a critically ill patient from the Isle of Arran in the Western Isles to hospital in Kilmarnock. The RAF's been involved in other Covid taskings, the most publicised a mission to bring back thousands of items of PPE from Turkey. On three, two, one, two, three. Earlier this month, they unveiled another contribution, a converted BAE 146 jet usually used for VIP flights but now fitted out to carry a stretcher too, allowing coronavirus patients to be flown around the UK or repatriated from abroad. Since the military's first coronavirus duties, delivering supplies to St Thomas's Hospital back in March, up to 4,000 personnel from all three services have been deployed each day as part of the COVID support force. In total, they delivered nearly 30,000 coronavirus test kits. At the end of May, the size of the force was cut, from 20 to 7,500 personnel. The Aviation Task Force 2 has now been restructured. But the job goes on, and while the front line may be very different from the one they've served on before, and Covid a very different foe, the military's eagerness to serve as vital as ever. Simon Newton, Forces News. Well, in ordinary times, we would have seen a huge military parade with cadets, veterans and serving personnel, the centrepiece of any Armed Forces Day celebration. So to tide you over until next year, we're going to leave you with a look back at some parade highlights from the past five years of Armed Forces Day. From Scarborough, goodbye and thank you for watching.
If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.